Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, hello and welcome everyone to the Art at Work Workshop, Conservation and Maintenance for Artists Who Work in the Realm of Public Art, with our guest presenter, Sabina Sutherland. My name is Biliana Volkova and I'm the Public Art Planner for the City of Richmond. I'm here to first introduce today's workshop and offer some tips on using the Zoom format during the session and we'll later moderate your questions uh, with our guest speaker, Sabina. For those of you who may be new to the program, Art at Work is a series of free professional development workshops designed for professional artists and arts organizations practicing in any artistic medium. This program is presented in partnership uh, by the City of Richmond Art Services and Richmond Art Gallery. Art at Work offers workshops from February through uh, October, and you can find any uh, information about upcoming Art at Work sessions on the Richmond Art Gallery and City of Richmond websites. I put the link to the program in the chat. Today's session is being recorded and will be available as a video released in a few weeks on the Richmond Art Gallery's website, as well as on our YouTube channel, along with the English transcription and edited captions. We would like today's session to be as interactive as possible. So please add your questions throughout the session as they come up and we'll try to get all of them during the Q&A portion of the presentation. We're gonna have two Q&A sessions, one in the middle of the presentation. So we'll take a break for that. And then at the end, to send us your questions, please use the chat feature on Zoom by clicking on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. When using the chat feature, please select everyone on top of your comment instead of host and panelists so that everyone can see your question. For those using screenshots readers today, I will read out uh, the questions asked in the chat so you won't miss any of the uh, questions. For those who require captions, click the CC icon on your screen to enable them. With housekeeping out of the way, I would like to introduce you to uh, our presenter, Sabina Sutherland. Sabina Sutherland has been a, pro a practicing professional conservator in the Lower Mainland since 2005. She has worked in some of the major museums and municipal collections to exhibit and preserve art and cultural objects, including outdoor public art sculptures. Sabina now works in private practice to care for artwork and archival materials and consults with cultural institutions on long-term collections preservation. Welcome, Sabina. Thank you. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, and here we are with the public art collection of the city of Richmond. So this talk is basically, um, we're going to go through and discuss the conservation of the artwork. And the way we're going to do that is to look at the materials and their properties and what makes them deteriorate, uh, the different types of deterioration, and what we can do to prevent or at least to slow that down. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the City of Richmond's public art collection in general. Um, it has grown in the past decade to include over 266 artworks, and 161 of these are considered permanent artworks, so permanent fixed sculptures in a given location. Um, the 105 temporary artworks would be considered a utility box wrap, um, some of the murals, um, works that are a little bit more ephemeral and not expected to last uh, more than 10 years, whereas the permanent ones have a ballpark of a 10 year lifespan. Um, but we're hoping that through further studying and investigation into conservation that we can increase that a little bit more and hope maybe for 25 years. And then I also wanted to just mention that out of the entire collection, there are between five and 10 that would be considered a more traditional work of art. So a painting on canvas that is displayed inside of a building. So as we know, most of the artworks are outside. 
And I also wanted to direct everyone to um, the website for the public art collection and our locations map. And this can be explored to find out where the different artworks are, to look up different artists and different artwork types. And the link is there. However, it is on the City of Richmond's public art website and is very clear and easy to find and navigate. So I encourage everyone to take a look at this when you have a chance. Um, so as I mentioned before, the main focus of this talk will be on the materials, their properties, and what affects their longevity. And we have diff all different types of materials in the collection, which we're gonna go through. So one thing that I wanted to bring up that's important to know is uh, the difference between what we would call an organic material and an inorganic material. So we're getting a little bit into the chemistry here. And the simplest way to explain it is that organic is living or once was living, so plants um, and animals. And then inorganic would be the non-living materials, such as glass, metal, ceramics, stone. Um, but in the true sense of the chemistry application, an organic compound is, an organic material would be comprised of carbon. So it's any carbon-based compound, and usually they're combinations of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. And the reason why I emphasize this is because polymers and plastics, which are not living, are actually considered to be an organic material um, due to their chemical composition. And so I just have a quick shot of the periodic table. And I would like you to look at uh, the right side. So we have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and then hydrogen is over here due to reasons that I won't get into. Its atomic number is one, and it has to do with how many atoms it has. But in the organic materials family, it usually combines with these ones over here. And many plastics are combinations of those. So we're going to start with inorganic here. This is a shot of one of our glass artworks that we have, fields. Um, we're going to go into the metals. So we have aluminum, which is a fairly stable metal. So different, a few works using a lot of aluminum. And then we have bronze, which is a more traditional sculpture or monument material. It's um, an alloy, so it's not a pure metal. It's a combination of copper and most commonly tin. The copper content is close to 90%, so it's high in copper, and it is quite stable. Usually, it uh, there's a patina or surface coating applied to it as well. So you can see the horse, the Minaru horse, is a black iron oxide patina. Um, the middle one is uh, more of a brown, a light brown, and the far right lions have a greener patina. So these can be uh, uh, formulated and designed based on what the artist would like, but they also offer a little bit of protection. Um, one other popular material that we see is corten or rust patinated steel. And what's special about this one is that it is allowed to get rusty. So the, the things that make it, um, the properties that lend to this material are, all, it's also an alloy. And it's, um, it, unlike bronze, it's copper content is only about 5%. But what happens with this is when it's exposed to water in the atmosphere, it forms a protective layer of rust on the surface. So it looks like it might not be very stable, but in fact, it actually is quite stable. And the name Corten comes from corrosion resistance. So that layer that I just talked about, and also a tensile strength, which means the pounds of force that the material can withstand before it breaks. So Corten steel also has quite a high tensile strength. It's used in shipping containers, train cars, and even in some bridges. 
And then we have painted steel. So this is different type of steel. It's just the structural steel. It doesn't have that copper. So the paint is actually uh, what can provide a layer of protection for that. Um, and then we have powder coated steel. And I wanted to talk about these two specifically as well, because the coatings are quite different, even though they're difficult to, uh, to distinguish with the naked eye. So paint, if we're all familiar with, is kind of a liquid mixture that um, is a pigment suspended in a binder with a few other additives to give it properties. And it's applied to a surface and it dries as a film. So what a powder coat is, is a powdered pigment and resin. So a, a pigment and a powdered plastic that is heat fused onto the surface. And powder coating actually requires a special facility, um, infrared heat technology, and um, the application technique is also very specialized. This has to be done in a special place, whereas painting can be done um, in on site. And then we have um, stainless steel, which is great because <laughs> it has very stable uh, properties. Um, it, and it's resistant to quite a bit. I mean, it does, it will um, experience some deterioration, but it's quite stable in the elements. Um, ceramic, this one is also very interesting um, because usually with ceramic, I think of dishes or things that are breakable, but the artwork in the collection made out of ceramic has really held up. And there's a lot of different technologies that can be applied with it today, such as the Evan Lee photos on the far right are actually a printed ceramic frit. So they're very uh, light fast, they don't fade, and it's quite long lasting if they're well taken care of. And then we have concrete, um, which is a mixture of aggregates, such as sand or gravel, um, water, air, and paste. So the paste used in concrete is Portland cement, which is a, a limestone-based material. Um, there's a lot of calcium carbonate in there. And so it's a main ingredient in concrete. And then there are more modern versions, um, such as the ultra-high performance concrete, which is used in building structures, uh, but some artists have also been using that. Um, the difference between that is that it has some polymer fibers as well as a polymer binding agent. And it's supposed to give the material a little bit more plasticity. So the ability to stretch a little bit, which is good because it's a little bit more flexible. And then we have stone, which is like bronze is quite a long lasting material. Um, we have in our collection basalt stone. So on the far left, these uh, Lulu a memory garden are slices of basalt. Um, there's basalt in, whoops, in this next one next to it, the Susan Point. And then we have these um, portals to the future, which is this third one, is a really beautiful limestone from Indiana, which is a very porous stone and the surface is a little bit more sensitive. So um, you can see this one has a few scratches on it, which unfortunately uh, are not very easy to repair. You actually have to remove stone to do that. Um, so even though we think of stone as being hard and durable, some are softer than others and they have a surface porosity to them. Sorry, I keep trying to point and then I change my slide. And then on the far right, we have a basalt bench again. So that's a popular one that we see. Okay, now we're gonna move into organic materials. So this one was an obvious example here. It's, um, it's on the former BMW dealership building and it's in the shape of a bumblebee. And many of you may have seen it over the years uh, driving on Highway 99 into Richmond on the right side if you're driving north. Um, so it's obviously an organic material, a living plant. Um, and then we have wood, and we all know 
how wood fares in the outdoors. And then we have um, some textiles in the collection. And this is where what I was talking about with a, a tradition, more traditional um, media and location of exhibition of artwork. Um, we have a Deborah Sparrow weaving in City Hall. And then the centerpiece is Achieving a Dream, which is another weaving at the Richmond Olympic Oval. And then we have, um, oops, sorry. Stepping stones, which are located in the city center community center. And so um, these ones fare better, a little bit better inside. But with textiles, uh, there is sensitivity to light and the colors are actually something that you want to be careful with, with the dyes. And then we have some examples here of the polymers that I was talking about. So the one here on the left is Mia Weinberg's Hamilton Then and Now. It's made from Corian, which is a material used in, um, in architecture. So like in countertops and things like that. It's basically a ground pigment and an acrylic resin. And then the center one is meander which is a modular work that uh is not actually fixed in place it's it's uh, movable and each part can be assembled as desired it is meant to resemble the river so it sort of has a flow to it um, but that's actually made out of polypropylene which is a plastic and then the third one is um, ebb and flow by Jacqueline Metz and Nancy Chu, and that one is uh, actually just plexiglass with a mirrored backing. So we we need to know um, what these are made out of in order to know how to take care of them. And then we have a series of artworks that include found objects. So a found object would just be something that's manufactured and brought in, um, not created by the artist, but added into the artwork. And we so we have an object assemblage with wood, metal, plastic, um, some different objects. And then we have a vehicle, so an old Ford truck. Um, it's painted steel. And then we have a an assemblage here that incorporates an antique piece of farming equipment. Um, it's actually a an, it's called a cedar. So what it does is it plants seeds in the fields as you drive it along. Um, but the artist changed it a little bit and um, made it sort of interactive. Sorry. And then I wanted to talk about composite objects. So I talked about materials in terms of like metal, stone, but some of them have more than one together. And so they would have a little bit different considerations because these materials react differently to the environment, which we will be getting to shortly. So we have glass and wood together. Uh, the beaver dam actually is interesting because the little figures are made out of foams with uh, urethane coating. And the one on the far right is stone and metal together. And then these ones are considered composite materials. So where the previous ones had distinct piece of glass and a distinct piece of wood, these ones are actually pigments and resins mixed together or combined so that they're more fused. Um, the Alyssa Schwann works on the left and center are made from polyester resin and a pigment. So in a way, it's a, it is a type of plastic because um, the base material would be that polyester. And then on the right, we have uh, enameled steel. So this is actually a similar technology to an old stove <laughs> where they uh, put a ceramic coating on the outside of the metal. And these ones are also really fascinating. Um, they're modern architectural materials, uh, but they are composed of organic substances. Uh, the marmoleum, which is the flooring material you see on the top left there, is um, 
the main ingredients are linseed oil, wood flour, and jute. So they are using raw materials, raw organic materials. Um, on the right here, we have Mia Weinberg's Sight Unseen. This material here, which looks like it might be kind of a wood, is actually made from post-consumer recycled paper that is mixed with resins and then heated and put under pressure to form these shapes. Um, and then the Trespa Meteon, which is on the bottom there for sale wall, is similar to the Rich Light. Um, it's formed under pressure. It's made out of wood-based fibers. Um, one thing, though, that they claim is that their surfaces are um, more resistant to dirt because they're, they have less of a porosity. Um, but I'm not sure if I agree with that because I've seen... Uh, a little bit of stuff on there. And then we have another exciting type of artwork that poses a unique challenge um, as well because of the software and electronic components that they include, which make which is what makes them really great, but it's something that we always have to make sure is working and that uh, the necessary troubleshooting can be employed when if something isn't working correctly. So now we have some time for questions just about materials in general, if anybody's curious or if they have questions about some of the materials that I just um, mentioned here. Yeah, thank you, Sabina. Yes, um, please feel free to um, put your questions in the chat and uh, uh, we can take it from there. If anybody has any specific questions about materiality or um, Anything in general, please let us know. Okay, there's a few coming in. Um, is there a local manufacturer for vir uh, virtuous enameled steel? Well, I've, I'm sorry, I, I don't know that answer. <laughs> I would have to look into that um, to be able to, to answer that. Uh, yeah, so we yeah we can look into that. Um, another question that came up is uh, what happens when the software goes out of date for some of these uh, media projects? And I can, uh, if you'd like, Sabine, I can respond to that. I mean, it it really depends on the work. Uh, it may be, uh, of course, there will be a conversation with the artist, but depending on the work, um, it it may have to be decommissioned um or um would have to um have have another um look into the uh um digital component to see if it would have you know it would have to be updated uh but uh, typically those ones last about 10 to 15 years yeah i think that's a great question because this is an ongoing challenge it's something that's very new still um between these two works, it's very interesting because the Heron work is actually a very low tech um, artwork in that sense. It's LED, like it's LED strip lights. So uh, the things that could go wrong there too are that the lights stop working and they have to be replaced. Um, so there's like the mechanical workings of it as well as the software, which makes it that much more complicated. Um, I don't know if you've run into that so far, Liliana, but it's definitely like at the onset of um, creating these works, that's something that we would hope the artist would consider because it has to last a certain time. If it stops working, we need somebody who can help to fix that and get it working as soon as possible, things like that. So they do require Every artwork requires a maintenance plan, but these ones are a special challenge in that sense. Yeah. And the air rain cloud is very like quite complicated. It has, it's not just the cloud there. It has a water tank and a panel box. Um, it has components behind the scenes in a separate room that have their own operations. So um, thankfully it's working really well, but uh, they are more complicated. And and just the one one other comment with the rain cloud, we um, we were really lucky to have uh, the artist um, come a, a few times now and or a couple of times and 
given a, a workshop to the maintenance crew. So they're equipped with that knowledge as well uh, because it does belong to the city. So we are needing to maintain it. So it, it's nice to have that connection with the artist and, and update that knowledge as staff changes as well. Um, okay, I'm just gonna keep going. Um, are there any special surface treatments for concrete? Does it absorb water in our wet climate? Well, this is if this is very also a little bit challenging to answer because there are several ways to seal concrete. Um, but that's a great question. You're thinking on along the right lines because concrete is porous. So if you seal it, it offers a that first degree of protection. Um, off the right off the bat, there's not no one product that I could just recommend as a solution. It really depends on the type and concrete formulations are so varied um, that you have to consider that as well as uh, the product that you're using. So it's a combination of both of those. Great. Uh, any other questions uh, about materials? Um, and so we have another comment. Uh, it's an ongoing problem for projects using media as the technology can change so quick. Yes. There was a project that was a gateway piece uh, at uh, LAX, uh, the airport. Um, the bulbs became obsolete within a year of opening. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Kamala. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's the, that's the type of thing that we would want to avoid happening which is why there's um, more and more, there's a lot of planning beforehand in the conception of the piece to try and mitigate uh, those issues. So it's it's a learning curve for the, pretty much the whole world. Um, I'm gonna get into that once we get into the next section as well. Uh, is there any, one thing I wanna say about the rain cloud that's interesting is it's called errant rain cloud for a reason. <laughs> It it uh, accumulates moisture and then the moisture condenses and it rains, but it only does that um, once it can gather the right amount. And so you can't program it to go on at 10 a.m., for example, but a lot of the visitors to the pool are quite, uh, they're asking that question quite a bit. <laughs> when does it rain, et cetera, but it's, it's only when it's ready. Yeah, sometimes it 4 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, shall we move on? Um, yes. I could also just quickly mention that at the end, I can give um, everybody my contact information because I'm happy to, if you have questions about concrete sealants and things like that, I'm happy to um, look into that spe more specifically if you would like. Um, and it's a little bit easier to have time to do a little bit of research um, based on a little bit more specifics. Okay, so, um, so one issue that we have with all artwork, with ourselves, with every material in the world, is that it doesn't last forever. Um, all matter deteriorates. Um, so in the world of conservation, we've identified these 10 agents um, that contribute to deterioration of matter. So some of them, most of us are familiar with. We know that light can cause damage. Um, it can fade a material. It can discolor a material. Uh, it can cause uh, things like plastic lawn furniture to become brittle and split. Um, we have uh, a lot of bad press gets given to UV light, but it's actually all light in the visible area of the spectrum is uh, causes damage that is cumulative and irreversible. So it's not just UV. Um, we have temperature and relative humidity uh, listed here with the word incorrect, because if they're controlled, we know that that's good for materials, um, depending on what they are, if they have different temperature and humidities that are favorable to them. Uh, but when they're not favorable, so especially when something is stored outside and there's no way to control that, uh, we need to consider that. Um, we're get, And here, especially because we're starting to get different weather patterns, we didn't used to have hot summers like we have in the past couple of years. And so 
um, it'll be interesting to see how that works as well. And we do live in a temperate climate with quite a lot of humidity in the air. So that can affect definitely the organic materials like wood. Um, there are physical forces. Um, that's stress. Um, people jumping on things can even be considered a physical force. Um, and then fire is a threat, obviously, because it causes immediate irreversible damage. Um, water is uh, water can speed up different deteriorative reactions and catalyze them. So in the sometimes the pre just having the presence of water there can exacerbate rust, for example. And salty water is even more exacerbating. And one thing that we we don't think about too much here because our air quality is quite good um, compared to some parts of the world are pollutants. Um, so gaseous and particulate pollutants in the atmosphere that will affect the artwork. Um, we have to look at pests. So uh, when you're outside, inside it's mostly insects and small rodents, but outside it can be from insects to small animals. Um, thieves and vandals, fortunately in the city of Richmond, that's not too much of an issue, uh, but we do see artworks getting marked with graffiti from time to time, or people put stickers on painted artwork, things like that. And the last one, which is a little bit, um, I included it here because it is one of the one of the important things. It doesn't happen so much with public art. Um, dissociation is more related to uh, like an, a collection, an art collection in a gallery where something doesn't have an accession number you don't know where it came from. You don't know who the artist is. So if there's something um, missing contextually that will uh, exclude it from your collection. So basically the idea is if you don't know what it is, you don't really have it. Um, in the sense of public art, it could come across as if there's no um, identifying plaque there, then that disassociates it from the collection because onlookers wouldn't know that it's a public artwork. They might say, well, what is this thing? Um, but most of them are identified with a plaque. So that side is taken care of. All right, I just wanted to have the electromagnetic spectrum here so that we can take a look here. So we look right in the middle, there's UV light, but this visible light is also a culprit. So when you buy a uh, something that's UV resistant. It doesn't mean that it it might protect against the UV a little bit, but it still allows the rest of the light in. Um, and that is, it will still affect materials. Okay, and I also wanted to just go over these pollutants um, so that we know what we're talking about here. So we have smog. Um, usually we think of big cities like Los Angeles, <laughs> but in the summer, especially, it's the reaction of um, light and particulate matter and gases. So it produces ozone at ground level. And ozone causes oxidative reactions to things. So rust is a common example that we can all identify with. Um, there's also sulfur oxides. So they are a component of smog. They're acidic and they contribute to acid rain. So if it rains in a smoggy place and there's that has artwork outside, that artwork will experience some of the acid that comes from that. Um, nitric oxides are a product of automobile combustion. They're also acidic. Um, they're in both vapor and particulate. And so they can settle on the artwork or they can mix with water and oops create that acid and then we have um, volatile organic compounds which are also part of combustion and um, one that we don't usually think of and isn't so common but it does happen are the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons so these are from industrial emissions or disasters such as the recent train collision in the US where they had uh, a terrible chemical um, that escaped from train cars. 
affecting the environment. So these are emitted by different indus industries such as pulp and paper, aluminum smeltering, and things like that. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit now about physical deterioration. I have this slide here of the wood pole, um, mainly because it's easy to uh, see that it's cracked. So where the object is physically changed, um, where the damage is causing, the damage caused affects um, the shape of the materials. This one is also a good example. Um, Perpetual Sunset is an artwork that is composed of over 40,000 sequins. And these sequins are made out of polyester. Um, and it is west facing. So when the sun was setting on the sequins, they tended to warp into the shape of a Pringles potato chip. So they stopped being flat. The wind picked them up and they flew away. And we're currently in the process of looking into um, replacing this work. But this is an example. So parts are lost. And so the artwork actually doesn't um, have the same effect as its original intention. Um, and then here's an example of chemical deterioration that I talked about. So this is a rusted gate. Um, unfortunately, the coating on the metal wasn't very protective and it's this is a quite an extreme example. Um, this one is one of my favorite phenomena, which is um, the this is a bronze work that was exposed to acids, which if you look at the artwork and see its proximity to the ground, you may be able to deduce that this is from dogs going pee on the artwork. Um, it's it is very interesting because sometimes the artists do like the turquoise color that forms as a result. If we all can think about the Statue of Liberty, for example, that is a bronze artwork that over the many years has formed an overall verdigris layer. Um, this one is a powder coated aluminum artwork. Um, one thing that I really want to stress here is the clear coat that you can see is peeling away is also claimed to be very UV resistant and durable. Um, but we see that over time, an exposure to these elements, um, they're still vulnerable to uh, breaking down. And then another form we have is called biological deterioration. So different living organisms can grow on the surfaces. Here we have a lot of lichen and algae that's growing on the surface of this um, artwork. One thing I want to mention, though, is that the powder coating on this work is very durable. It's amazing. <laughs> and so um, thankfully, uh, it's located in a park and thankfully it its experience of this growth doesn't hasn't affected it too much over the years so it is quite stable and structurally stable in spite of the tendency to grow algae um, this one's really interesting uh, this is the Richmond firefighter and over the summer it was discovered to have a mud wasp nest attached to it <laughs> So it's it's kind of interesting because I wouldn't consider bronze to be a favorable host for, for a home for bugs, but I guess if they can build on something and probably um, it's a warm spot being a metal that gets warmed up by the sun, maybe that's why they like to go on there. And also um, this is something that wouldn't necessarily affect the artwork in a major way. It's more of a menace to passersby if they're worried about getting stung for example. And this one was very interesting in terms of pests. Um, these are columns that have kind of a map grid pattern inside. Um, they're covered in an acrylic sheet. And somehow bugs have gotten within the structure and it started to make nests right in the parts of the maps. <laughs> um, I looked into, I thought, 
well, now how is that going to get cleaned out? But the the work is designed to be easy. Well, the parts can be disassembled. And so that will be something that is achievable. But it's when you're planning your artwork, this is probably not something that you're going to anticipate at all. But it, it's it happens. Okay, so I wanted to just now go through some, some of the examples in the public art collection and just show the different wear and tear that they've experienced. Um, we talked about this a little bit in the beginning. This is Farmer's Bench by Norm Williams. So it has this antique found object, um, which in this case welcomes a little bit because it is antique, it is worn, um, it's expected that it isn't going to last outside forever. So a little bit of weathering is okay. Um, but the the additions, which would be like this planter here that the artist put in, is quite worn out. And then screws started to be exposed, et cetera. So at that level, that's when a conservation treatment or some restorative intervention is required. Um, here we have another one um, by Jermaine Co. It's the number two road drainage pump station. So these are different elements that are made out of painted steel that reflect kind of the energy related to what the pump station does. So she has a lamppost, a cell tower, a rainwater collector, an electrical one there. Um, but what we're looking at right now is just the the rusting on the metal because it is right at the Fraser River and it's by the pump station. So it does experience um, a lot of water contact with moisture. And this one is also one that's starting to have some wear and tear. Um, this is a wood and glass combined piece that also has uh, LED light strips inside. So the middle, the columns will illuminate at night, which is quite beautiful because the etched glass patterns are really nice to see. Um, but the wood on the exterior is starting to weather. Um, it didn't have a, a like a super durable stain on the outside. Um, also, if you look at the center, there's these kind of white scratch marks that were made by wasps because they were harvesting the cedar to make their nests. So you that's another pest interaction. Um, but then there's also the biological growth. So with the lichen and algae, um, and then later I'll show you, we, fix, we had to replace one of the glass windows um, because those elements are more fragile and can get broken. And here's another one um, that's, that's uh, quite worn at this time. So it is made out also out of cedar and it's a, a really interesting bench in Terra Nova Park. Um, it's still fine, it's still structurally stable, it's still usable, but the appearance of the wood and a few breaks are probably not what the artist originally intended. And this one, Everything's very interesting. <laughs> this one's also very interesting because um, this is another product. Uh, it's called Tenara. I'm sorry I didn't write the word down for everyone. It's a special textile fiber made by DuPont. It's used in space technology, so NASA will use it. Um, it boasts a very high UV resistance, um, but actually, it has faded quite a bit since um, it was installed at the time of the Olympics. And then it, back to this one again, just to show everybody that uh, the left picture will show you the rusted me the metal underneath the ceramic enamel coating, wherever it's exposed um, is vulnerable to moisture. So the rust will form underneath and eventually become exacerbated. And then we have another um, fairly recently installed artwork. Um, this one was showing some issues with the paint. We weren't, because we didn't see how it happened, um, we can only speculate that maybe somebody tried to climb on it 
or something like that. And um, it's in line to be uh, restored this spring because the type of paint used on it, which is an acrylic polyurethane, requires um, a certain temperature in order to cure. So they can't apply it unless it's dry and warm enough outside. Um, so now I'm going to go through a few case studies where we were able to do some restorative treatments on some of the artworks in the collection. And these are always really satisfying um, to look at and hopefully interesting to the artists. Um, one of them here is Water Off a Duck's Back by Douglas Copeland. This one is a powder coated aluminum and it is a water feature. So it's always in the water in this fountain. Although they do, I think they do shut it off in the winter months. However, it has water flowing through it. And one thing that was noted, um, if you look on the far left image, the channel inside where the water comes out was painted black. So this paint has a um, marine grade, high resistant to water. Um, it boasts um, properties that it's long lasting, but it was vulnerable to water. So that's where I, I really, um, we'll talk about that more at the end of the talk, but where I really think it's important to know what your materials are as much as possible and how they will behave. Um, in contact with all those agents that we talked about. So um, another thing that I noticed on the work was that in the channel here, there was rust staining. So somewhere in the construction, there was steel hardware, um, even though the sculpture, the media for the sculpture is powder coated aluminum, there is still some small steel screws or something to that effect that rusted. And so it caused some staining. And as a preparatory measure, because I talked about um, the paint being uh, needing a special um, curing temperature, uh, the fabricators were able to assist with this restoration. It was a fairly new work, so um, they were able to help clean up all the rust and remove the, um, the, the marine grade paint, and then they're going to approach it with a different solution this summer. And then this one so far has received a small upgrade. There was a broken glass panel and um, that was replaced, which in the big, the overall look of the artwork, it does make an impact to have the broken piece um, fixed right away. Uh, we will, like I said, be working on the wood this year. Um, to do an overall restoration of the entire artwork. But in the meantime, it was really important to just have this panel replaced. Um, also, you don't want, sometimes when there's damage caused, it can invite additional damage, um, unfortunately. So you wanna get those things taken care of as, as soon as you can. And this one was also a really fulfilling um, treatment that could be performed on the artwork. So this is Human Nature by Paul Slipper. It is carved granite uh, and the pieces are actually not full pieces of stone. Some of them have joins in them that the artist constructed and then carved afterwards. Uh, so on the left, the stone is a lighter color. You can see on the standing figure, it has a kind of a yellow patch above its head, which was um, a lot of moss and lichen growing. And the artist actually, when he saw it, he said, oh, I kind of like that. But I said, well, it'll come back in a few years. Um, hopefully, hopefully his coating will last longer than that, but on the right side. So he came back to not only recoat, clean and recoat the stone, but there was one that actually had a break on it. So he had to recarve, reattach, clean the artwork and then seal it. There we go. So it was just one of these um, unfurling fern ferns here. Um, 
it was noted that something was missing and it looked like there was a bit of a gap. So it, it looked kind of alarming. And then um, Paul recarved this piece and reattached it and sealed it. So it actually looks like new. And then this was another one. Um, this artwork is on a private property. It's Jacqueline Metz and Nancy Chu's Made in China. And it consists of five aluminum dragons that were originally powder coated um, to resemble kind of a chrome surface. So on the left is actually the after it was complete this summer. And on the right is before. And we'll get into a detail. So if we look right on the right side, that's how the artwork looked when it first was installed. It was very shiny, um, that sort of chrome effect. And in the center over the years, uh, it actually started to look like it was becoming tarnished. So the metallic luster was gone, as well as a lot of surface dirt that accumulated over top. So the, the, um, the manager of the property was asking us about um, how to restore them and whether cleaning would be sufficient. And unfortunately, you can't achieve the shiny surface anymore after it's been tarnished. Um, the, far, the picture on the far left was really something interesting here. So what happens is if there's even a pinhole in this powder coat, water can get inside, if it freezes, which only requires zero degrees Celsius, it will expand and disturb the powder coating and actually cause it to pop off of the metal. Um, the white layer you see here is aluminum oxide, which forms on the surface of aluminum. It's like the rust for aluminum. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of problems with the powder coating. So what happened here was we managed to contract contact the original fabricator of the artwork. So he carved, cast these objects, and then they were powder coated by another specialist. Um, but we went through a few different options, and it was decided that probably the most feasible and less least invasive option was to clean the current deteriorated powder coat, sand the areas, and then just re recover the artwork by painting it instead um, because to repowder coat this artwork all of the figures would have to be removed and taken to a special location where they have a room and an infrared heat source to, to effectively powder coat the artwork so powder coating again cannot be done on site it has to be taken to a special facility it's much more expensive um, so um, it was decided to go with the less invasive uh, treatment and it, it worked very well. Another thing that um, was added here is a protective wax layer on top of the paint. So that's similar to um, taking care of a car outside, which we're mostly probably all familiar with. Um, if you don't wash your car, it gets dirty. If you wax your car, it helps repel the dirt a little bit better so that you can extend the times in between washing. And that's um, similar to what we want to achieve with the public artworks in the sense of conservation is to apply these preventive measures in the beginning so that um, maintenance and restoration is spaced further apart than it needs to be and then it allows the artwork to last as long as possible. And so I just um, would like to kind of conclude the talk today a little bit with just going over this again. So um, I have this Gathy Falk work out, the apple work, um, as a metaphor maybe for an apple a day, right? The preventive approach to our health. Um, and that's also a great example because it is made from bronze, but it has a coating so it has this a uh, this isn't a uh, one of the traditional patinas it's actually an acrylic polyurethane paint and then a clear coating on top so it has double protection 
which also acts as part of its aesthetic intention here. So it's durable, it has a great coating on it, and that will help with the, the longevity of the artwork. Um, with maintenance though, so one, one of my analogies is automobiles, because we can all relate to our car getting dirty. If we don't clean it, it can lead to rust. If the paint gets scratched, that can lead to rust. So what we want to do with the art is um, monitor it. If coatings are a few years in and they need reapplication to reapply them, um, but to also look at the paint or powder coat and see how that's faring, because that's the first defense um, for the underlying material. And that has to be eventually reapplied. So um, when you plan to have the artwork outside, it just doesn't go and sit there and look good forever. <laughs> we have to do this ongoing uh, maintenance that's involved. Um, so in along those lines, it's becoming more and more common that municipalities are asking the artists to provide information on the materials, as well as information on how to maintain them. Um, that's something that's an area that still needs a little bit more uh, growth in terms of um, what happens with products is that they have product specifications and product claims. But something that when they test their paint for UV resistance, they're only testing it with exposure to light in a chamber, in a laboratory. And these artworks, um, the, when they're painted with that product, they're outside and all the variables that aren't included in lab tests, such as pollutants, water, light, um, all of those contribute differently and make the product behave differently. So when you're looking at your the paint that you're interested in, for example, and it says, oh, it's, you know, it lasts forever and it's 100% UV resistant, you really need to uh, consider those product claims to maybe have a, a caveat for these works because they are outside. So expect to, um, update and maintain the work uh, because nothing will last forever, unfortunately. But we're trying to make it as last as long as possible. And yeah, so it's, I think it's very exciting to take a look at all these different things. And I hope that uh, learning about what um, what's involved in maintaining the works and in creating them can uh, we don't want to tell artists what to use, but certainly it could help inform your decisions on your final product as well. Thank you so much, Sabina. Uh, that was really great. Uh, we always learn so much about maintenance and uh, conservation uh, practices and also about our collection. So thank you so much. Always great to um, hear you speak and give us a little bit of your knowledge. So we do have some questions coming in. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for putting them in the chat. So uh, I'm just going to go to the questions, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, one question we have is, uh, what have been the most durable materials for outdoor pieces, those that have required the least amount of maintenance or repair, for example? OK. Do you want me to answer that? <laughs> I I had information about that, but I also didn't want it to influence artists in terms of like, just do what you want, make what you want, get it, but try to get the best advice on how to make it last the longest. So in through looking at this particular collection, I did notice that a more low maintenance artworks are usually the murals, um, architectural features such as glass windows, um, things like that that are not necessarily as exposed to the elements, but also don't invite graffiti or things like that. Um, and bronze is obviously like a tested, tried and tested material around the world that we know is very durable. However, we wouldn't want to say every artist has to make something in bronze. We don't, 
we would like to have diversity in the collection. Um, and then the Corten steel as well that we talked about is quite durable. Where you, where you can run into issues, uh, like I said, is the powder coating. It can fade in the light. If there's a, a little scratch, um, it can get rusty underneath there. And it's also more difficult to touch up. So what, what you would have to do if you like, you can't take the whole artwork away and get it re powder coated for one little scratch. So what you would do there is seal the metal and then use a paint to try and match, but it never looks good. You can always see it. Um, so I guess in that sense, I would encourage maybe to consider painting something versus powder coating because the maintenance is a lot easier and it's way less expensive. And you can get a better range of colors. You can't mix powder coats to get a new color, but you can mix paint. So there's more variety there. Um, some of those new contemporary architectural materials that are very organic are susceptible because the, the moisture in the air and the rain causes them to warp and distort and also kind of delaminate, which is when they start to come apart. So I would say, like some of those composite materials, some of the organic materials, they can suffer a little bit more deteriorative effects, um, but those can also be mitigated and that would be encompassed in part of the maintenance plan. Because like I said, we don't want to tell people what to use. I think it's really exciting to see all the different materials that are being made for different purposes that are being incorporated into artwork. But it's just a matter of um, having the test of them being outdoors and then seeing how they behave and seeing what can be done to slow that down. Thank you, Sabina. Um, just moving on, uh, I think you mentioned this, but if you could just repeat, what kind of coating is used on the top of the painting for the apple sculpture? Oh, well, that's a very interesting one. So I don't, I'm st I was still trying to find out the specific name for it from the fabricator and haven't been able to yet. Um, but I know that I believe that it's a, an acrylic polyurethane coating as well, like similar to what the paint is. Um, I can tell you that that system is called the Matthews paint system. So I would strongly encourage you to look that up and see what types of clear coats that they offer. Great, thank you. Yeah, and it's such a lovely piece if you haven't seen it. It's in the Capstan um, area of uh, Richmond. So we uh, it's also on our website as well. Um, moving on, uh, can you speak to the process of deciding which artworks get maintenance work and when? Is it based on matter of urgency, a predetermined maintenance plan? Thank you. I think we can both answer that, but Sabina, go ahead. Oh, do you want to answer that? <laughs> uh, why don't you start? <laughs> um, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, new commissions now in the last several years, um, it's been part of it to have this maintenance plan in place, which is great. Um, but with any, you know, with any other kind of collection or situation where you have a few different things that need attention, you do have to prioritize those. And so um, part of my survey that I did this summer actually was to organize the artworks in terms of priority. So the first, when you see part of an artwork that's missing, like that's kind of crucial. So anything with a part that's gone you want to have remedied because it is an immediate um, deteriorative issue to the work and it interferes with its intention and all that. And then you have some that are very dirty maybe, but their coating is very stable. So if you have one that's equally needs a clean but has a less stable material, perhaps you would go to that one first. Um, but they do have recommend, like these products have recommendations, you know, to reapply every two years, that type of thing. Um, so it's, uh, it usually 
is when like the high priority ones or when they're visually disturbing or obvious that it needs something. Did you want to add to that, Ileana? Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, first of all, yeah, it was a very helpful tool uh, just to know what we have in our collection and, and uh, what the maintenance needs are because we have, you know, uh, close to 200 pieces. So having this in condition assessment done um, is very crucial. So then we can actually start the maintenance plan for repairing of the works that need it. And then like Sabina said, she did put it in different categories. So having the ones that are the most crucial, like category one is the, uh, how we start to look at the maintenance plan. Of course, it's budget related, uh, capacity related, staffing and so on. So uh, we just look at um, the priority one works and then uh, go from there in, in terms of our budget and and, and capabilities. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention um, is that the collection of public art in Richmond and, and other cities too, but Richmond specifically, of course, there's civic artworks and there's uh, works that are owned by Stratus, like private public artworks. So uh, the city is responsible for the civic ones only. Um, the ones that are on private land are uh, maintained by Stratus. So part of our work is to um, let them know uh, if uh, any of the works are in need of maintenance and, and also uh, give them the findings from our conservation um, assessment. So that helps the Stratus know what they have and how to take care of them. And they also have their maintenance plan uh, of the works as well. <clears throat> so moving on, there's a few questions coming up. So I just want to make sure that we get to everybody. Um, what the type of paint are the most durable? Well, I think enamel paints um, and this Matthews paint is becoming quite popular, but they're all vulnerable to chips, scratches, um, nothing lasts forever. The one that we looked at, Lily Tree, I don't know if you remember that slide, but it has a primer on the metal as well. So it has a double kind of coating, an extra coating to it. Um, but I don't know, like there's no paint that I can think of right off the bat that's the best. <laughs> so these are, unfortunately, there's no like right or direct answer, which is why there's so much research that goes into conservation. I know the Getty in Los Angeles, for example, is actually researching uh, wax coatings right now and trying to formulate their own because what happens is manufacturers change their formulas. And so if you're using a certain product for years, they might put something else in it that you weren't aware of and they don't always disclose that. Um, so you you never, sometimes you just don't know. And then it doesn't have the same protective properties anymore. <laughs> Unfortunately, that happens a lot. So that's why a conservator, like I wouldn't, if there was graffiti on an artwork, I wouldn't go and grab a bottle of graffiti gone because i as a conservator, I don't even know what's in there. So ethically, I shouldn't be using that. Um, I hope that explains. I'm I'm very sorry that I, if I had those kinds of answers, our lives would be very easy. <laughs> but there's it's always a problem solving, and research and testing and seeing how things react. And you know, in different parts of the country where the climates are different, they have different issues than we do in Richmond like Edmonton for example mm -hmm. their powder coat like powder coats can often kind of bleach out so they they fade to like a whitish color and that happens oh that has happened there quite a bit so we we haven't had that yet here it's not the same problem and then they have colder longer winters than us yeah so there's just so many variables to work with um, and just to follow up on that question from the same person, any comments on auto paint for artwork? Oh, okay. I'm, I spaced out there because yes, automotive paint is actually very high quality. Um, what I mentioned before is like one common opinion that I hear all the time is marine grade this, marine grade that. Well, guess what? Boats get repainted all the time. So it's not like you paint them and then they can travel in the water for 25 years without getting rusty or a barnacle on them. That's not the case. They have to meet 
um, certain standards and they need to be repainted. Like there's people whose job it is just to repaint ships. Um, same with autos, but I think between those two in the use of public art, I think that I would uh, actually lean towards the automotive paint a little bit more than the marine. Um, but that's just my own anecdotal opinion right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but they seem to have a lot more durability than what we've seen um, in marine paints being used. And I think they're, you know, it's just a very obvious seeming um, product because we're in a, a marine climate with salty air and water. Um, so that's why you would think it's kind of the default, but uh, there's a lot of auto paints and clear coats in the industry that are actually a lot more durable, but those are in the enamel family and they're very toxic and smelly and require special uh, places and protective equipment to put them on. But I'm always amazed, like when it comes to restorative treatments, I'm always amazed at what the auto industry can do. Like when your car gets scratched and they repaint it to look like nothing happened, like that's actually difficult for a conservator to achieve. So um, anyways, thank you for for reminding me of that because yeah, that's, so info. That's a good point. We've talked about that. Yeah, the automotive versus marine paint. Um, couple of comments. Um, Glenn, thank you for this. So there's a company in the north of the north end of Richmond, which does Dura Nara, which is an improvement on powder coating. So thank you for that. Oh, uh, yeah. I have to look into that. Um, and then just a reminder that we are recording this and the, the recording of the session will be on the Richmond Art Gallery's YouTube channel in a couple in a few weeks. Um, a question about the anti-graffiti coating for murals. Uh, uh, is there one that you can recommend? Um, same thing. It's I don't have like a go-to product, but basically like putting a clear coat that can help with UV as well as uh, graffiti is good because it's a defensive layer for the mural. So um, if that's put there in place, then the graffiti is applied on top of that and it's it's uh protective to the very it's like a painting that's varnished right you have that layer of protection that just gives a little bit extra so that if it does get graffiti removing the graffiti doesn't take the paint off um, but for a lot of these public artworks um i think that in certain cases you could just repaint portions of them if they get um that level but we haven't really seen um that particular level of damage usually they're just little like I've seen drawings done in chalk <laughs> so that's quite easy to remove but it, it is helpful to have um the protective coating it's also important to know the substrate that you painted on some of the murals uh that we have one of them ended up forming some bubbles because it was painted onto some corrugated steel, which gets very hot in the summer and the heat causes the expansion and swelling of the paint. So um, it's not always graffiti that can affect it, but, but it's a, a combination of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, the substrate that it's painted on. Um, just a couple of comments that this has been a very informative uh, session and uh, um, that um, yeah, artists are thanking you for your knowledge. Um, oh, that's great. A comment from Glenn, there's a paint used in a water park industry that is two-part polyethylene spray called Hericot that is basically auto paint and a few companies in, uh, in these parts do it, but apparently it's very expensive. Caracot. Okay, thank you for that. And yeah. another uh, prop, uh, Glenn, uh, also proper graffiti coats are typically a sacrificial wax coat, which gets washed off and recoated. Yes, I've, I've actually just started uh, learning more about the wax coat method for anti graffiti coating. Do, do you know anything about this, Sabina? If you can well, I mentioned it? that the Getty Institute. Oh, yes, yes. In Los Angeles, like their conservation division has already begun research on the wax coatings because they have 
uh, bronze outdoor sculpture as part of their collection. And so they are working to protect that. So yes, a lot of wax is used. And that what that's what was used on the Made in China statues. And um, something that's great about that is that you can apply it on site. Um, it's not something that needs to be sprayed. So it can be done fairly um, easily and and it's uh, not as toxic. And then it, you know, it lasts a couple of years. And then, of course, needs to be reapplied. But it, it's help. It's very helpful. Great. Um, oh, and the the paint in the water park industry is called hard coat, not hair hard coat. coat. <laughs> hard coat. Thanks, Glenn, for that. Um, any other last comments, questions? as we are looking to kind of wrap things up. Always very informative. And a reminder that we are recording this and we will be posting it on our website um, in a few weeks. So you can always refer back to the session. And if you have any questions, please do uh, let us know and we can uh, pass them on to Sabina. So, uh, Yes, just wanted to thank Sabina again for this wonderful session. Um, like I said, we always learn a lot from 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 uh, this uh, and from your knowledge. Um, I wanted to also uh, let everybody know that we do have another art at work workshop coming on April 27th. And that one is on conservation best practices for studio-based artists, also with Sabina. And that one's going to be in person. So uh, you can join us at the Richmond Cultural Center Performance Hall and uh, meet Sabina in person. Uh, we're gonna be uh, posting the link for registration on our uh, website uh, sometime the, at the end of uh, March. So look out for this. And also I wanted to remind everybody that we are gonna be sending a survey at the end of today's session. And we would appreciate uh, all of your input to help us plan and improve our upcoming offerings for this program. And I just, again, want to thank you for coming and for supporting Art at Work. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks. And I would like to quickly thank everybody as well. I, it's a little bit, um, it's unfortunate that we can't see all your faces, but I really appreciate all these floating hearts that we're seeing. Um, so I hope that you've been able to get some valuable information about um, kind of the planning for the longevity of your artwork. And as Biliana said, I'm happy to answer anyone's kind of more specific questions where I have a little bit more time to look into the answers for you, but I would love if I could provide any assistance in this area. And one thing that I want to mention for those who are successful in um, earning a commission is to really know what materials you're using to have the kind of specific information in your maintenance plan. Um, I've seen a lot of artwork that says in one part of the, the plans that it's powder coated and then in the other part that it's painted. So that's that can be very confusing. <laughs> so uh, if, if on your end, you can be very uh, sure about what it is, specific about what it is, um, and also the dimensions of your artwork, if you <laughs> could provide those as well, because that's something that often gets um, overlooked or it's incorrect. Um, yeah, but but uh, having those the key information about what it is in the first place is actually the most valuable because uh, from there we can we are able even to determine the best ways to maintain what the material is. Um, but if we don't know for sure what it is in the first place, it makes it a bit more challenging. So I just really wanted to emphasize that. But I I really hope that it's helpful and um, that you'll be encouraged by some of the different media that um, we have here in Richmond. And uh, you, if you remember the public art website and the locations map there, if you're interested in going to view any of these, I strongly encourage it, um, especially this work, but you can't take an apple away with you, <laughs> even though they look like a candy apple. Um, yeah, so thank you all very much.
Thank you, Sabina. Thank you, everybody. And yeah, lots of comments of uh, thank yous and uh, um, really appreciative of, of the program and the um, the workshop today. And I just want to actually uh, remind you that we do do um, uh, let you know that we do do public art uh, tours at different times of the year as part of culture days or doors open. So look out for those as well if you'd like to join us on a tour and, and find out more about our collection in person. Thank you again. Bye. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.